<laughs> so <laughs> that was um, kind of an in invitation to step out for for a while out of the human centric approach <coughs> to the matters that we researching and think <coughs> in the plant world world as a possible um, um, domain of uh, maybe um, as much as wisdom as we may have maybe a, a bit more as <laughs> they've been around longer than us <laughs> and just to keep um, the question in your mind while we talk about plants in the addiction treatment if we're dealing with uh, alkaloids or with animals with a uh, beings with intelligence or just uh, chemical uh, products that uh, cause certain effects in the human mind. I'm still recovering my breath from uh, going back and forth two times to my house to pick my keys <laughs> under the sun, so <laughs> sorry I'm a little agitated. So I'm going to uh, <laughs> recite today about uh, traditional <coughs> medicine in addiction uh, rehabilitation. <coughs> and I wanted to begin just by saying that this is not my field of research uh, right now and um, so why I'm presenting about this is just because this had a um, profound impact in my life and the way I, I see the world that I inhabit and uh, because I believe in uh, in a respectful and comprehensive intercultural di dialogue as, as a very important thing that we as transpersonalists we should engage when dealing with uh, um, wisdom uh, traditions of the world. So I'll be talking not only about intervention but about the context where these interventions arise. So this picture is of Amaloka, which is a place where um, plant ingestion sessions are carried, uh, the ayahuasca rituals among uh, others like purgative rituals and other kinds of rituals that I've been talking about. And even though, um, uh, so I'm going to introduce also Takiwasi, which is the Center for Rehabilitation of Addictions and a Center for Research in Traditional Medicine, where I worked for two years between 2005 and 2007. And my presentation is going to be not about research, but about my experience there what are some of the things that I've learned over there and just presenting the model and open it to discussion. Even though I didn't do specific research on this, uh, two um, publications came out of this. One was a book chapter in, uh, it was called Plant Teachers as a Source of Healing in the Peruvian Amazon. In, uh, in the book Wild Foresting, Practicing Nature's Wisdom, which is a long and beautiful argument uh, about why we should keep uh, places of the world untouched by human uh, action. And so our, our chapter is dealing specifically with the uh, healing potential of uh, nature, as uh, Zach was pointing out uh, this morning too. And the other publication was uh, uh, Yoga in Addiction Treatment, because I was uh, part of my work there was uh, doing a yoga workshop three times a week with patients in, in treatment for two years. So I just systematized the experience and got published. So that's something to take with this too, is that we can just organize our very neat experiences and turn it into, into products that can be out there for sharing. So um, I wanna share with you um, A video. This is a trailer of a documentary that is about to be released or just released of uh, Takiwasi treatment as a kind of introductory piece. It seems like it's taking a lot to load, so if we at least get the first three minutes, that would be something. All right? <laughs>
I have many habits, many different drugs, um, all kinds of drugs, but I mostly used uh, cocaine and I used to cook it, uh, make it into freebase. It's similar to crack, but it's not crack. I wasn't taking LSD just for fun at first. And then little by little, um, I became implicated in the LSD uh, scene in Switzerland um, and the rave scene. And it started becoming something more recreational. I got to a point where I was using it once a week. Um, and yeah, I, I got lost. I, I lost the... I was on this J'avais été dans des centres en psychiatrie pour essayer de me soigner, mais je voyais que, que ça n'avançait pas. Pour moi, je n'avais pas l'impression d'avancer. Des, des médicaments, des médicaments, des, dans cet état-là, de, des choses qui nous, qui nous mettent dans des états de, de fatigue ou qui, qui nous en sucent, ça ne nous sort pas de nos problèmes, ça ne nous, ça nous, ça nous en sort pas. Et moi, je me voyais en ressortir de, 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 de leur traitement plus faible que fort. Le centre Kakimasi est un centre qui est destiné à essayer de faire une conjonction, une articulation entre les apports de médecine traditionnelle, amazonienne surtout, et la psychothérapie occidentale pour élaborer un protocole thérapeutique. <rire> Takiwasi is in, uh, located in the High Peruvian Amazon. Um, it's about a one day, 24 hour bus trip from Lima to the northeast. It's in the um, basin of the uh, Guayaga uh, River. Um, and you could see a little bit of the uh, ecological environment in, in the video. This is Jacques Malit, a person that I personally admire very much. He founded this center. He started receiving uh, patients in 1992, but uh, he um, he started to get trained as a curandero with local curanderos, shaman healers, since 1986. And before that, he's been going in different parts of the world, looking for different ways of treating diseases, not just addictions. Actually, he didn't want to deal with addicts, but uh, the vision of working with addicts keep coming in his ayahuasca sessions and he kind of resisted a lot and finally <laughs> said okay <laughs> and that's how the center started receiving patients in 1992 and uh, uh, now I think it's more than a thousand patients that uh, the center has received for a treatment that goes from 9 to 12 uh, months so, um, Takiwas is located in the outskirts of Tarapoto. It's a kind of commercial uh, town uh, that is uh, surrounded by um, agricultural activities as production of coffee beans, rice, tropical fruit, and tobacco, and most notably for production of coca leaves, and base paste, and cocaine, <coughs> especially in the 80s and 90s. So uh, most of the cocaine that was pro produced there was uh, exported to the United States. And uh, the in-between product of that process is base, uh, base paste, which is very highly toxic. 
neurotoxic and very cheap to get in Taraboto. So many kids got addicted with, uh, with basic taste in the process of producing cocaine for the states over 20, 30 years. This uh, was worsened by the politics of wars on drugs, which not only hasn't uh, given any positive results over 25 years, and that's, that's why it's been highly questioned in the later years in South America, but it has um, uh, made um, crime uh, a link to narco traffic like uh, skyrocket like for for decades now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the mod model of treatment that uh, Takiwasi uses. Uh, a center piece is the access to uh, of to modified states of consciousness in a specific context protected by local tradition for the treatment of addictions. In the um, way that um, Takiwasi understands addiction is that not only every human being but every being, whenever possible, modify their consciousness. And I I, I saw it many many times uh, with butterflies, for instance, just getting drunk on on fermented mango in a, in the in the Peruvian Amazon. They they're just stone. They stick their tongue in the from a mango, you could grab them, lift them, lift them down, they, you wouldn't realize. But <laughs> humans are fascinated, <coughs> particularly in amplifying our understanding of what, the, what reality is and what we really are. And uh, addiction is uh, seen as um, um, confusing one, um, one part of the path with the end of the path. Uh, there is a a hole in the center of the human being, as we say, that you was saying that uh, the addicted person aims tries to fill with uh, with drug, but it, that hole is never filled. And maybe in a theistic tradition, we we could talk about a, a God-shaped void in the center, or just a, a thirst for mystery and meaning. Um, I want to highlight the context because uh, uh, I, after being exposed uh, as a therapist, I was part of the clinical uh, team and I had to go undergo the whole plant treatment several times. So I have to do therapeutic plants 40 times, at least uh, ayahuasca sessions about 60 times and, and so on. And uh, one thing that is really clear for me is that ritual is not an aesthetic process, but it's a very kind of uh, logical uh, and precise procedure to protect the energetic body of the people that are involved in the ritual and you need competent guides to do that so I would never uh, do something like this in a context that I'm not sure that it's guided by an adequate guide the center was is operated by licensed pro professionals and the treatment is voluntary people are not and uh, that uh, we're not accepted, they're not, we're not willing to, to be treated. And unlike other um, uh, community, um, uh, communities to treat add addictions, it was run by professionals and some others, it's like ex-addicts treating other addicts, at least in, in South America. Uh, minimal or no use of manufactured pharmaceutical or over-the-counter medication, so people that arrive there with a, a prescribed medication for any reasons, as we were a team of six, six psychologists, three uh, healers, curanderos, and two uh, medical doctors <coughs> that were also curanderos, we were able to uh, decrease uh, the amount of medicine that people were taking and start using plant medicine. And that worked very well. So in the first months of the treatment, people were not only uh, uh, detoxified from the drugs that they were addicted to, but also from the pharmaceutical drugs that uh, the body uh, was getting all sorts of side effects, as we all know. Um, it, of course, it uses the traditional Amazon medicine, and I'm going to focus on that in this presentation. There is an inter integral view of the person, body, mind, and spirit, inserting a cultural and social context. There is, uh, we, were, we were looking for the autonomy of the patient when leaving the treatment many uh, treatment models replace one's, one's sort of dependence to a healthier sort of dependence. 
on God, on an institution, on something else. And uh, the access to a spiritual experiences in a context that would give spiritual meaning um, was hypothesized to um, fill that void and so that the person would be able to sustain themselves and their health in the long run. So it searches for a strong intrinsic motivation from the patient. It's a hard treatment. I mean, taking plants is hard, hard work. It's not, doesn't fit any kind of um, um, romantic visions of uh, getting high and finding yourself. And I mean, that happens, but it's not a pleasant process. And the model is non-coercive. I, I don't know what ha if this happens in, in North America, but in South America, in many uh, therapeutic communities, violence is used. Like when somebody is uh, relapsed or did something wrong, they do things like putting them in the circle and shout insults and stuff like that. Is that familiar at all? It used to be. It used to be. Mm -hmm. I think it's declining over there too. <coughs> the sacred use of plants is not equal to substituting drugs and uh, by taking uh, plants in for two years, I, I can say that for sure. Uh, like the, the more you take, the less you want to take it. <laughs> so it's really a sacrifice to go and do it because it's, uh, this, the flavor is very disgusting. It's uh, facing very shadowy aspects of yourself. It's, it's hard work. <coughs> and um, Takiwasi doesn't use a hierarchical model of sobriety, so like kind of patients that are five or seven months in the treatment are not in a hierarchical position to the ones that are just started. And abstinence is not the goal of the treatment. Like, I mean, if people remain abstinent of consuming drugs, it's kind of a partial su success for, for this model. But finding the meaning of life at a deeper level, that's place where the center is aiming for. And there are three main axes for the treatment and we have uh, the ergotherapy work, uh, the ergotherapy which is um, all sorts of communal activities and maintenance of the center, cooking and whatnot that is therapeutically oriented. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. There were many psychotherapeutic interventions um, individual therapy, group therapy, creative expression, uh, dream work, post-ayahuasca sessions. Um, but, um, and the third axis is the use of plants, and mainly uh, the purges, which are plants to detoxif detoxify the organism and also the, the psyche, because each different purgative plants, and we use about 15 different plants, work in different levels of, of cleansing. And the ayahuasca, which is of course an important piece of the treatment, and the, um, the dietas or diets, which are ret uh, retreats, solitary retreats in the jungle, that uh, patients had to do three of them during their stage of nine months. And we as therapists, we had to do like every couple of months too. There is this underlying assumption that we're all patients, mm -hmm. like we're all healing from something, we all have the same void in the center. Of course, we, we, we are in different roles, but we are together uh, vomiting our demons, <laughs> <laughs> to put it poetically. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about, about plants. And as I said, there are purging plants, master plants, uh, which are plants that are taken in this retreat in the jungle, in the diets, and the ayahuasca. And we cannot understand the plants without uh, the curanderos or the healers. And here we have uh, Don Luis Curquitón, Winston Tangoa, and Don Ignacio Perez. Which uh, um, Don Luis and Winston are um, curanderos ayahuasqueros, means that their main uh, speciality is, is dealing with a, uh, ayahuasca mm -hmm. and that ritual and that uh, healing process. And Don Ignacio Perez is perfumero and tabaquero and icarero, which means that he worked with perfumes, with uh, tobacco, and, and with icaros, which are uh, songs. Those are the instruments of healing.
and we're going to see some pictures of that. So, hope you had a nice lunch. Yeah. Uh, but this uh, is part of reality too. Yeah. So these are the Purgeon sessions, which last about seven hours, mm. and like you start at three a.m. at three p.m. and that goes until the night, and you feel horrible, really, and especially with this lady here, the Yawarpanga, which is kind of the queen of the Purgeon plants. It's just amazing. But the following day, you feel like you have, you resurrected from death. It's like even what you see is clear, what you hear is some sharper. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts are quiet. It's amazing. Here's the Rosa, Rosa Sisa, and this is Leonardo. I think Rosa Sisa is Marigold, mm -hmm. maybe, or Taget, um, which is mixed with uh, tobacco juice, and that's a very strong purge at the mental level that really, really quiets down the mental energy. And uh, Nardo or Azucena is used especially to cleanse sexual energy. It works in this level. So when you're purging, you, you get images sometimes, or feelings, or memories, mm -hmm. and that are associated with levels that I'm talking about. And so patients, during their first two months, they purge a lot. Actually, they arrive and they purge every two days. And because the first part is mainly the de detoxification. Very interesting. Uh, I think we were talking about this a couple of days ago with Olga, but um, smells of the body, of uh, even substances that people have ingested up to 10 to 15 years ago and they haven't consumed anymore, arise in the purgative sessions. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the quality of the experience gets stored at a molecular level that is even other people can perceive by just smelling the body or the vomit. This is the preparation of ayahuasca, which is also a ritualized process. People cannot get close to where the preparation is, is done, and the person that cuts the plant is in a sexual abstinence, and there is a, a healer that comes and sings a couple of times a day while the plant is prepared. And the preparation, <coughs> uh, the ayahuasca concoction that we can see over there that boils for about 12 hours. Uh, it's a mixture, actually. It's a mixture of um, the um, ayahuasca vine, or Banisteropsis cavi, which is a, um, a vine, vine that grows in the, all the Amazon basin area. And it's a mix of this and the chacruna, or Psychotria viridis, which is a plant that in this, how do you call this in, in English? Like little pods? But yeah, here it, it stores uh, dimethyltryptamine, DMT. <coughs> that, um, I think, yeah, I have this slide to, to, to explain a little bit better this. Um, chacruna alone or ayahuasca vine alone wouldn't produce the effect that uh, both things together produce. And as you can imagine, it's not that in the, the Amazon jungle, there's not a, a, a chacruna bu bush right next to an ayahuasca vine like growing together, <laughs> like very orderly. Actually, they, they grow at different altitudes. So it's still a mystery how people find, found out that this very specific combination could produce this amazingly special concoction. Um, why they have to be together if we wanted to reduce this a little bit to chemistry? Uh, the ayahuasca vine has um, alkaloids like, like uh, carbolines, armines, and armalines structure that functions as inhibitors of the monoaminoxidase. Do you say that in English? Um, and these inhibitors of the monoaminoxidase prevent tryptamine to be metabolized when you ingest it orally. Because if you would just ingest the DMT, that would get metabolized and wouldn't have any effect because of the monoaminoxidase. But this inhibits that process, so the DMT has uh, the effect on consciousness. It's a very, very precise. So trial and error, probably not. Uh, the, what the healers say is that they, 
they learn from the plants themselves how to mix them, where to find them, and who could benefit from each plant combination. And they, did, they get these messages in the diets, which are not eight days long like uh, we do or the patients do, but these are three months, six months in isolation in the forest, uh, taking uh, master plants in uh, sexual abstinence, not having sugar or salt, and, any, and many other restrictions that I will talk about in a minute. Am I going too fast? Is this fine? <coughs> and I wanted to share especially uh, today a little bit of the phenomenology of the ayahuasca experience as the patients uh, take ayahuasca once a week for from month two to month seven more or less unless when they are in diet where they have a three week period of not mixing with uh, ayahuasca so every time the, there is an ayahuasca session people have to drop <coughs> some of their visions the next morning and then uh, later we have the ayahuasca post ayahuasca workshop like every week to process what emerges because it's not only the experience that is uh, I mean the experience alone is doesn't have the transformative power is it if it's not worked through or processed so people think that they would take pills of Farmawaska, and they will get cure of things. <laughs> so, these are some of the visions of the of the patients. Specifically, this is related to the sense of catharsis, of purging, of letting go. Uh, even sometimes they feel they let go of entities that have uh, possessed them for for a while. <laughs> then. They say that the bucket is the best friend of uh, Taki Wasi's uh, visitors. <laughs> <laughs> because you're always hiding your bucket. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> visions of oneself. Visions about addiction. The hidden ser serpent, the serpent that appears a lot in the phenomenology of the ayahuasca experience as a, a medicatrix force, a healing power. And this is kind of cross cultural because the, in Takiwasi we had patients, of course, from Peru, but also from Asia, from <coughs> Europe, from the States, and you can find the, the serpent appearing all the time. Finding existential meaning. So it's not all suffering, <laughs> fortunately. But both ends are related in the ayahuasca session. You usually have to look deeply in what is what needs to be seen and and healed to access meaning or possibility. So that was just to give you a taste of uh, what people might experience in, in, in the ayahuasca session. Um, this is the diet. I, I, I managed to sneak in a photo camera for this is my second diet. Um, that was my tambo. This is the place you live for eight days. There are no walls. There is an, a hammock inside and a, a screen, mosquito screen. Um, so you can survive. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's the food that you get. It's uh, plantain. Uh, boiled usually or white rice and you get that once a week if you're not fasting once a day if you're not fast fasting and fasting is not that difficult really because you, you do nothing 
literally. I mean, you have to walk to the river once a day to, to wash yourself, but the rest of the time you're in your hammock, doing nothing. You cannot carry books. You cannot carry any piece of technology, not a, even a watch. You cannot uh, bring candles uh, or um, any anything. You cannot bring soap or a detergent or a to toothpaste. Anything that has smell, anything that has taste, and the body being in touch with the, with nature uh, re restarts, like reboots itself. It's like getting all the the healing energy from the the natural world while you uh, are taking a, a master plant, and that specific plant is designated to you by the therapeutic team formed by the psychologists, doctors, and curanderos uh, regarding what you need in terms of your physical health, uh, psychological health, and energetic health at that moment. So, and you get to, you get interesting visitors when you're there. <laughs> Iguanas can come, sometimes snakes. Nobody has died of being in diet. <laughs> but it's it's a very interesting experience. Experience. It's very hard. It's actually the opposite than addiction. You have nothing to fill yourself up with. You're just there with yourself, and all sort of stuff that you haven't thought in ages comes up. The you're not uh, s after the second night night you're not sleepy anymore. So waking life and dream become very close and dreams becomes as crisp as watching a, mu a movie you wake up in the morning and you recall like every detail in technicolor interesting what happens when when you're not overstimulated uh, as Zach uh, described in, in the morning um, so it's a process of isolation no ingestion of salt sugars or fats uh, this is supposed to open the energetic body. When you not don't take salt, you don't take sugar, your energetic body opens to the healing forces of nature. And anything that needs to go out, goes out too. Uh, there is a daily ingestion of a master plan. The only person that can visit you in, in the forest is the, is the healer that brings you the plant. And also the psychologist, like, like uh, me and others, we would visit every other day to check in and we as visitors even we were only half an hour 40 minutes with them <coughs> we had to be in sexual abstinence we had to avoid certain foods before going there because that could cross the diet like affect the process <coughs> and so the diet has cleansing physical effects centering psychological effects spontaneous meditative states dream stimulation followed by insights and intense memory recall it's always uh, surprising for me that what uh, patients uh, thought as the most powerful part of the treatment were the diets, not the ayahuasca or not other things, just being on their own, facing their own stuff without the possibility of running away. How am I doing? Uh, um, beyond already? Yeah. Oh, okay. Can I have five? Finish? No? Mm. Wrap it up, it's over. Wrap it up. <laughs> Wrap it up, okay. These were some of the uh, master plans that were used and the effects. Um, other energetic interventions like the tobacco blow, the perfume blow, uh, baths in the river, the master is uh, singing the water to take the energy and uh, energies away from the body of the patient. Ergotherapy, as I said, is working. By working, you learn to cooperate, to uh, finish products, uh, start and finish something, uh, be responsible, be honest, learn skills too, very practical things for patients when they're going out. And therapy approaches is mostly what we psychologists did there, individual therapy, group uh, therapy, other body-mind therapies, I will show some of them, like karate, rock climbing, and 
I was in charge of meditation and yoga at the time. I'm really going fast now. <laughs> On other rituals, even a patient getting married. The yoga workshop. Fancy yoga mats, eh? So, um, just to sum up the results from people that finished the treatment, uh, they recovered in 67% of the case, which compared to the conventional, with this kind of patients, these are patients that have been in addiction for 15 years, average with multiple drugs. So uh, the comparison with the conventional treatment is like 15 to 20% recovery. So 67 is pretty good. Level two means sometimes consume drugs and the unstable jobs and kind of life not really coming together yet. And 18% that we, we just don't know or they're, they're kind of fully relapsed. And this is one of the patients, he authorized me to share this picture, but please don't make a zoom. Uh, this is before and after the treatment. And I just like to I feel that the I say it much more than mm -hmm. graphics sometimes. Thank you. This because the assignment was to maybe talk about a dissertation project. But right. Was it like going through this again. It was great. I've I been feeling more and more that <coughs> I haven't shared this experience enough, and the couple of times that I've done it. Like people are very happy about it, and I get happy about this. Mm -hmm. So I decided to find spaces to share about this a little bit more. So it was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.